Welcome back, everybody, to episode 63 of the Quantum Science Seminar, which today will be all about quantum gases and scale invariants. As usual, we would love to have your questions. Please send us your questions to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com or use the YouTube live chat at the right or at the bottom of your screen. Uh, as always, when you send us those questions, please note that there's a 30 second time delay between what we're doing here and what you see as live on YouTube. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Leticia, who will introduce our speaker today. So hello, everyone. It is really a big pleasure uh, for me today to introduce our speaker, uh, Jean Dalibar uh, from uh, Laboratoire kessler Posel and uh, Collège de France. So Jean is uh, right now a professor at Collège de France in Paris. Uh, he studied uh, physics at École Normale Supérieure in Paris, uh, where he has done uh, most of his uh, career. So uh, he started um, working on the violation of Bell's inequalities in the team of Alain Aspe, as in these very famous experiments that uh, most of you know about. Uh, and then he moved to do a PhD thesis under the supervision of uh, Claude Cohen Tanucci on live matter interactions and actually on explaining uh, some Doppler cooling, Sisyphus cooling. Um, afterwards, uh, he was guest scientist at Gatesburg uh, before then um, uh, going back uh, to Paris where uh, he has been working on laser cooling first um, and then on a very broad variety of uh, topics concerned uh, with ultra cold uh, quantum gases with both the Einstein condensate and very important achievements that we all have in mind is the first observation of uh, vortex lattices in uh, rotating PCs. Um, then uh, the study of the uh, BKT transition in uh, 2D Bose gases where you had vortices appearing um, uh, um, uh, thermally, then he has done a lot of work on um, artificial gauge fields uh, with ultra cold atoms, with uh, Raman coupling schemes, also uh, with uh, lattice shading techniques. Uh, he has been studying that theoretically a lot. And over the last years, uh, his work has focused on uh, 2D uh, Bose gases, uh, the kibble zurek mechanism when you quench across the phase transition. And what uh, we are going to hear about today, which is the study of their scale invariants. Uh, so Jean has worked on such a big variety of topics. Uh, he uh, also got many, many prizes for them. Actually, uh, I was checking the list uh, for uh, preparing this introduction and there are really way too many, so I cannot list them all. So he basically got every possible prize of the French um, uh, Academy of Sciences. He's a member of the French Academy of Sciences, the European Academy of Sciences. Academia Europea, um, uh, fellow of the OSA, uh, of the APS, uh, but uh, prizes from all these uh, societies and very recently, 2021, the gold medal of uh, CRS. And so we are really uh, very uh, lucky to have uh, today uh, Jean giving a lecture on scale and conformal invariance for cold atomic gases. Thank you, thank you very much, Leticia, for this uh, very kind introduction. So indeed, I would like to speak about a topic which is actually a rather broad topic in the physics of cold gases. As we will see, it touches the bosons, it touches fermions, it touches the molecules. So it's, uh, I think, an interesting uh, topic to, to cover in this uh, very nice series of uh, quantum science seminars. So thank you, Leticia. Thank you to the other organizers also uh, who are online, uh, Sebastian, Oriol, and Andrew, for organizing such a, such a nice series of, of talks. Uh, so uh, scale invariance in general is something which is uh, uh, encompassing many, many topics, not only in physics. It was introduced in physics in the 1970s. It, it comes actually from high energy physics. At that time, there were some uh, cross sections uh, that were measured, the scattering cross section between electron and nuclei. And uh, these cross sections seems to be energy independent. And so the question arose at that time, whether there could be some physical systems with no intrinsic energy or length scale. And that's how scale invariance emerged in physics. And then this concept was applied in many branches, in physics, of course, with, uh, with the phase transition and the notion of critical exponent, but also in math and even in biology, uh, you can find some scale invariance uh, process in the growth of bacteria, for example. So today I will not like to, I will not speak about uh, biology or math, I will speak about physics and more specifically, I would like to speak of scale invariance in a gas of particles. 
And to, to say it briefly, the idea is to find uh, systems uh, where the equation of motion are invariant in a proper rescaling of position and time. Uh, so what does it mean to have uh, equation of motion which are invariant? I mean that the action that is integral of energy times dt should be invariant when I do the proper rescaling. And the rescaling that I would like to make, and you will see in a moment why I do this one, is to say, okay, I take a parameter lambda, I divide all the position of my system by lambda, I divide the time by lambda square, and I look at the system I obtain with this. And when, when the action is, not, is invariant into this rescaling, I will say that I have a scale invariant system. And as you will see in the rest of the talk, this brings a, a considerable simplification of both equilibrium properties and dynamics. So first, why did I choose this proper this rescaling of position and time with lambda here and lambda square here? Well, the answer is very simple. Uh, in a gas, you have two types of energy. You have always the kinetic energy and possibly you have also the interaction energy. So the first, let's look at the kinetic energy, which is always here. Uh, when I do the rescaling of position and time in the following way, velocity, which is just dr over dt, will be multiplied by lambda. And therefore the kinetic energy, which is v square, will be multiplied by lambda square. And therefore the product kinetic energy time time, which is the action associated with kinetic energy, will be invariant. And this is the reason for which in non-relativistic physics, you choose this rescaling in position and time. And so now if I want an interacting system, which is scale invariant, I'm looking now for a system where the interaction energy also scales, it's also multiplied by lambda square, like the kinetic energy, when I divide all position by lambda. And when this occurs, as I said, there will be some very nice, very specific properties of my fluid. So can we find examples in nature of scale invariant gases? Again, system where dividing the position by lambda means uh, uh, changing the, the, the interaction energy by lambda square. The simplest example, obviously, is a gas where the interactions between two particles i and j scale like g over r ij to the square. Uh, so one over r square potential. This is not a Coulomb potential. Coulomb is one over r. This is a, a different kind of potential, one over r square. When you have this kind of potential, then you know that the interaction energy will be scale invariant exactly like the kinetic energy. So a system with a one over r square potential is, has actually been studied a lot in mathematical physics. This is so-called calogero mother sutherland model in 1D, and there are very interesting uh, exact results known about this system. I will not speak about this model because it's a bit mathematical, uh, not really implemented experimentally in the labs, but I will speak in the talk about the Efimov problem in 3D, where here again, I will explain you why there is a one over R square interaction energy which emerges in the problem. An important uh, remark to be done is that when you have such a potential, uh, one over R square, you have no length scale which is associated to interactions. And this is a notion that is very simple, but I think it's worth emphasizing it. If I give you a power law potential, g over divided by r to the n, where as in n can be any exponent, then in classical physics, you have no length scale associated with that. But as soon as you turn to quantum physics, then uh, you have h bar, which in turn is a problem. And this will give you a relevant length scale associated with the potential g over r, r to the n. You can do this simply by dimension analysis, but you can also do some reasoning, which is a bit more physical. Ask yourself, what is the size L of the wave packet so that kinetic energy and interaction energy are comparable? So you want to have h bar square over ml square, kinetic energy, comparable to g over L to the power n, which is this interaction energy. Now, if you take n equal one, and g equal e square, you simply recover by that the, the Bohr radius h bar square over m e square. If you take n equals six, van der Waals interaction, g in this case is just c six, the dispersion coefficient associated with van der Waals interaction, and then l is simply the van der Waals radius scaling like m c six divided by h bar square to power one four. But we immediately see that if you take n equal two, this one over r square potential, then you have l square on the left and l square on the left on the right, and therefore you have no length scale associated with interaction. This is another manifestation, another way of saying that I have a scale invariant system. 
So uh, the one of our square potential is nice, but it's not easy to implement in, in, in our gases, except for FEMOF interaction. But when one may look for other systems which are scale invariant, and actually within uh, cold gas uh, studies, there are two examples of a scale invariant system. First, you can take a 3D spin one half Fermi gas in the unitary regime, where the scattering length between the spin up and spin down diverges. Then the scattering length is, in, is infinite, so doesn't bring any length scale in the problem. And therefore, you recover immediately a system where interactions come without any length scale, and therefore, you have a scale invariant system in this case. Uh, if you want to know more, you can look at the beta pyres uh, boundary condition associated with the military regime, infinite scattering lengths, and you will see indeed that uh, this is a scale invariant uh, system. The other example, which I will also discuss in my talk, is the 2D Bose gas. Uh, that is a Bose gas which is uh, described, well, where the interaction between, between atoms are, are described by the contact interaction delta of R in 2D. So some G factor times delta of R. And there, if you rescale the position by a factor lambda, R divided by lambda, then you get this delta of R over lambda. And this is a well-known property of the Dirac distribution that in dimension two, this is nothing but lambda squared G delta of R. In 3D, it would be lambda cube. In 1D, it would be lambda. But I want a lambda square to get the scale in interaction. And therefore, I have to take this contact interaction in 1D and only in 1D. Now, as soon as you start to speak about contact interaction in more than, than, than one dimension, and in particular in two dimension, like what I am doing here, you have to be careful because uh, contact interaction in more than one dimension are not really uh, well defined in quantum mechanics. However, they are well dis dis defined if you do a classical field theory. So when I speak about scale invariance of a 2D Bose gas, I mean a, a 2D Bose gas where I can adopt the classical field description, so to speak, uh, the gross Pitalitsky equation. And then what I have just said is, is, is correct. If uh, the classical field description is not valid anymore because the coefficient g is here is too large, then I have to quantize my, my, my field. And therefore, then I have a quantum anomaly which appears from the regularization of the, of the direct distribution. And I will, see a bit, I will say a, a bit more about this quantum anomaly later in the talk. So, uh, just to be to, to make the things uh, clear, when I speak of a 2D Bose gas, I adopt this classical field approach. I assume that I have a, the, the class described by a classical field psi of R and T, which obeys the gauss psi equation. The energy of the gas is the sum of kinetic plus interaction energy. Kinetic energy is just the integral of the gradient of psi, where psi, psi is classical field, gradient psi square integrated over the area of the gas. The interaction energy for contact interaction is just the integral of psi to the four. And what I have in front here is a coefficient g tilde, which is the interaction strength. So again, at the classical field level, everything is okay. I have no worry to have, this is perfectly well defined. So I can do this in any dimension. In 3D, the, the coefficient g tilde, which is written here, is simply the scattering length A, 3D scattering length A times four pi. And therefore I have some in a, some length scale associated with interaction. Whereas in 2D, G tilde here, you can view it just simply by the dimension analysis, is dimensionless. Again, there is no length scale associated with interaction. So the 2D Bose gas, seen from the classical field point of view, is scale invariant. Good. So this was a short introduction to the, to the situation I want to study. And now this is the outline of the talk. There will be two parts in the talk. The first one will be about time independent problems. And I would like to illustrate what is, uh, what is the advantage of the scale invariant situation uh, on three topics. First, the universality of the equation of state, then the solitons, which will appear in a 2D Bose gas, and then the Efimov effect in 3D. Uh, then we can stop for a few questions, and then there will be a second part about time-dependent problem, where I will discuss some generalization of scale invariance, so-called conformal invariance, and time-permitting, I would like to discuss two applications of conformal invariance, which are breathing mode and breathers. If I don't have time to cover the last topic, it's not, uh, not a big problem. So let me start with the first part, time-independent problem, and let me start with the equation of state. What is the equation of state? of a scale invariant system. 
So let's start with a simple 3D gas as we are used to in our laboratory. So this 3D gas usually is described, the interaction in this 3D gas are described by a scattering length A. And again, in quantum mechanics, as soon as you have a length which appear, A, you also have an energy scale, which is h bar square over m a square, where m is the mass of the particles. Now, when you look for an equation of state, uh, you may look, for example, uh, for the expression of the phase space density in 3D and lambda cube as the function of some thermodynamic variables, which can be the temperature, for example, and the chemical potential mu. I'm working here in a kind of grand canonical uh, picture. Since I have an energy scale, a natural energy scale in my problem in 3D, not, not scale invariant for the moment, I can look for the, the, the expression for this dimensionless quantity n lambda cube as a function of two dimensionless variables, which are kBT over epsilon, energy scale here, and mu over epsilon. So I have a two variable function giving a dimensionless quantity here in terms of two dimensionless variables, kT over epsilon, mu over epsilon. Now let's turn to the scale invariant case. Let's take, for example, a 3D uh, Fermi gas, which is scale invariant. So it can be an ideal, Bose gas, an ideal, ideal Fermi gas, A equals zero, or an, a uh, unitary Fermi gas, A equals infinity. So now, as soon as A is zero or infinity, I lose my energy scale, h bar square over m a square. And therefore, I still have here a dimensionless quantity in lambda cube, and I still need to find a dimensionless variable to express this n lambda cube. And the only dimensionless variable I can form now is simply the ratio of the two energies, mu divided by kBT. And therefore, it is a considerable simplification of the equation of state, because now this equation of state is only a one variable function and not a two variable function. So that's a direct, obvious, very important manifestation of scale variance. And now for those of you who like thermodynamics, once you have a, this type of equation of state, you can show this uh, quite uh, remarkable relation that the product of pressure times volume must be equal in three dimensions to two thirds of the energy. Similarly, for the 2D Bose gas I was discussing before, described within a classical field analysis, then the phase space density in two dimensions, n lambda square, should be a function again of, the, of mu over kBT, this ratio of the two, two variables, and G tilde, the dimensionless, dimensionless coupling that I introduced also before. And then, again, if you like thermodynamics, you can show that the product pressure times volume should be equal to the total energy of the system. So this fact that uh, the, now I'm dealing with a single a function of a single variable means that now the, for an, a scale invariant system, it's quite easy to measure actually uh, the equation of state. Uh, the easiest way to do it is to work, to place the, the gas that you want to study into a, a smooth external trapping potential, V trap of R, and to rely on the local density approximation. The local density approximation tells you that if, if your potential is very smooth, uh, that is, it varies little, uh, very little on a, any microscopic length scale, like a, a thermal wavelengths, for example, then the local chemical potential mu of R is simply the potential at the center of the trap, mu of zero minus V trap. And therefore, when, when you, you take your, your, your gas in a trap, you, you span all the, the, the very big range of chemical potential from the central value mu of zero to the value completely on the edge where V trap tends to infinity. So mu tends to minus infinity, meaning that you have a very dilute gas. And now if you take a single image of your gas in the trap, you measure the density, N, lambda, N of R, you multiply by lambda square. And since mu of R is varying continuously from mu of zero to, to minus infinity, when you go from the center to the edge of the trap, you get immediately from a single image, this value of the function G that you are looking for. So this was implemented in various groups for the two Bose gas in Chicago, in the group of Shanghai, in Paris, in Cambridge, in the group of Zoran Zibabich. And this is how it works. So here in the inset, you see the result of several pictures taken for various atom numbers, various uh, temperatures. So these are radial density profile, density in micro uh, atoms per micrometer square as a function of R. And when you plot all these density profiles on the same curve as a function of, by taking mu over kT as a variable and plotting here n lambda square, 
you see that you have a collapse of all density profile. And this collapse, this function that you get here, is nothing but the equation of state you are looking for. So here I've taken this data from uh, the paper by the group of uh, Shangxin in Chicago, which is quoted here. G tilde in this, uh, in this, uh, for this set of curves was 0.26. And we, we have similar curves for what we did in Paris. Okay, so that was the first example of the simplification brought by uh, scale invariance. Let me take a second example, which is solitons. Solitons now in two dimensions, again, because I want to use uh, the 2D Bose gas. So how do we get solitons for the gross specialty equation? So we, we take, we, we are looking for uh, the, some wave function psi, which uh, is stationary, with, which makes the energy stationary with the energy, the gross Pitaevsky energy functional. So for this, we have to take an attractive nonlinearity. So G has to be negative in the gross Pitaevsky equation. So I have an energy here, which is a sum of the kinetic energy to add psi square, interaction energy G times psi T of four. G here is negative. And I am looking here to a negative uh, for a psi such that with for a negative G, this quantity here is stationary when my, I make a small variation of psi. Here I've taken H bar equal mass equal one uh, because actually this problem is not specific of uh, quantum gases. It's also a problem which is relevant in optics where psi now is not anymore a matter wave function, but it's a, uh, the electromagnetic field. You can find it also in condensed matter. So this kind of energy function is really general in physics. And uh, for, for atomic physics, uh, what I want to do is normalize my wave function, the integral of psi square is the number of particles I have put in the system. If I was working in optics, it could be the energy of the electromagnetic field. So it's easy to make a dimensional analysis of this energy of uh, E of psi, which is written here. Let's say that I take a wave packet of size L. So I have already said it before, uh, the energy which is here, uh, the kinetic energy scales like one over L square. And this interaction energy, which is here, is minus absolute value of G, because again, G is negative to get a soliton. So I, I get the absolute value of G here. Uh, I have the number of particles which interferes here from the normalization of psi square. And if, if I'm working in a dimension D, D being one, two, or three for the moment, I get this L to the power D. So let's look at the possibilities for this, uh, from this dimensional analysis. So I have written here, again, this here, uh, energy time uh, as a function of the, of the size of the wave packet. And let's look first in one dimension. So in one dimension, I have something which is one over L square from kinetic uh, minus one over L from interaction energy. So if I plot E of L as a function of L, as the size of the wave packet, for large L, uh, what dominates is interaction energy, minus one over L. For short L, what dominates is the kinetic energy, plus one over L square. So I get this type of curve. And with this type of curve, I know that I always have a minimum, which is a stable minimum. And the value of the minimum scales like one over N absolute value of G. So in 1D, we know that solitons exist for any n or any g, that is, for any atom number, any strength, provided right, it is negative, uh, I will get a stable uh, wave packet to sum. If I do the same thing in 3D, now I get 1 over L square minus 1 over L cube. So at large L, what dominates is 1 over L square, kinetic energy. At small L, what dominates is minus 1 over L cube, interaction energy. And now I have this type of curve. And now I have, again, an extremum, but the extremum is unstable. So I don't get uh, uh, stable solitons in 3D, at least for this kind of energy uh, integral of psi 4. And again, if I turn to the two-dimensional case, the scale invariant case, I see that I will get 1 over L square minus 1 over L square. So I don't get for any value of n or g, I don't get the solution. I will get a stationary solution only for discrete values of the product NG, which will make this one over L square balance, balance with this term NG over L square. So this is a, actually a system which was studied first uh, in optics by uh, Charlie Towns and co-workers in 64. And the solution of the soliton in 2D is called the Towns soliton. And uh, what uh, Towns and co-workers have found is that if you look at uh, the psi which makes this energy stationary in 2D, you 
have to solve the Gauss-Pierre scale equation. So minus one half Laplacian psi plus G psi cube equal mu psi. We, again, with the integral of psi square equal N. And what Towns have found is that you get a solution uh, and they, they're working for radially symmetric and nodeless. So you get a, a solution if and only if the product NG is equal to a specific value, which is minus 5.85. And now people know many digits of, of this value. And this solution always has an energy which is zero. And now scale invariance manifests itself in the following way. Once you know a given solution psi of this equation, you can form a continuous family of solutions with exactly the same atom number, that is always the, same, the product NG equals minus 5.8, simply by rescaling your initial psi. If you take phi of R, which is lambda psi of lambda R, you get again a solution of this equation with a different mu, different chemical potential, but again, this is a solution with a zero energy. So once you know one specific tan soliton for a given atom number, given, given G, you will get a continuous family of solutions with arbitrary sizes. And this was seen uh, recently in uh, two groups, actually, uh, in our group in Paris and the group of Purdue, uh, uh, and it was uh, published back to back in PRL a few months ago. In our group, we work with a two component gas uh, with rubidium 87. In the group of Purdue, uh, they worked with a phase bar resonance uh, with cesium. And here I present the, the result actually of the group of Purdue. Uh, so, what they started with was a, a, a cigar shaped gas, so essentially a 1D Bose gas. And at time t equals zero, the sun suddenly switch the confinement from 1D to 2D. And they also quench the, the interaction strength from a positive value, a repulsive value, to a negative value, what is needed for, to get solitons. And they look at what happened to their gas. And they see a formation of many, many droplets, droplets of various sizes with various atom numbers. But now, when they rescale all the droplets as a function of the central density, they find that all the data collapse on the same curve. And this curve is exactly the Towns profile I was showing on my previous slide. They could check, and also we could check in Paris, that you get this, uh, this, uh, this quasi-stable droplet only when you have this product N times G tilde on the order of the 5.8, which was find, found by Towns and co-workers. Here in, in Purdue, they got minus six with an error bar of 0.8. But the, the, essentially, the data are completely compatible with the prediction of Towns. And this is the same thing for us. OK, so this was a second example of scale invariance. Now I would like to turn to the last example in this first part, which is the Efimov effect. Uh, so the Efimov effect is a subtle effect. It's an effect uh, related to three body physics. So it's relatively complicated to, to, to explain and to understand quantitatively, at least uh, as Efimov proposed it in 1970. Efimov, Efimov was considering three particles of uh, equal mass interacting pairwise by an interaction which could become resonant. So here, I'm not going to discuss uh, the, the, the way Efimov presented uh, his effect. I'm going to, to discuss a, a variant of the Efimov effect uh, proposed by Fonseca a few years later, which is a three-body problem again. But now it's a problem with two heavy particles, the big particle with, uh, with capital M uh, for their mass, and a light particle with a mass little, mass little m here, shown in, in red. And I will assume that there is no direct interaction heavy heavy. So the, the blue particle here does not interact with the blue particle there. But I assume that I have a, some interaction, some contact interaction actually, between the heavy and the light particle. So little m here interact with big M and big M here via a scattering length little a. And I'm looking to, 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 to look at, I'm going to look at what happens when scattering length a, the heavy light, the contact uh, scattering lines uh, tends to infinity. That is when there is no bound state between little m and big m, but the bound state is just about to appear. So I have no two boundary bound state, heavy plus light, but I would like to show you that I have an infinite number of bound states, heavy, heavy, light. And again, scale invariance will be present. So I'm going to use a Born-Oppenheimer approach to, to, to this problem, which is, as you will see, very simple. 
So uh, as usual in born oppenheimer approach, you assume that the heavy particles are fixed. Born oppenheimer usually you do it for molecular physics. So you assume that the nuclei are fixed and you look at the motion of electrons. So here I assume that the heavy particle, particle of mass big M are fixed. And I look at the motion of the single particle, little m. And so uh, I want, I'm looking for a bound state for this, uh, for this light particle. And this light particle, when it is not touching the, the, the big particle, is a free particle. And so I'm looking for a bound state for a free particle. And as you know, uh, if you are doing 1D physics, this is what we all learn in first year quantum mechanics, if you look for a wave function, which is exponential minus kappa x, where kappa is related to the energy by the energy is at minus h bar square, kappa square over 2 negative energy. So here we are in 3D, so it's not exponential minus kappa x for the wave function of the bound state, but it is exponential minus kappa r over r for 3D. And actually the center uh, for, for, this, uh, for this exponential minus kappa r over r is either the, the position of the, of the one of the two big part, uh, heavy particle or the other part, heavy particle. So, I take uh, this wave function, exponential minus kappa little r minus capital R over two, or exponential minus kappa little r plus capital R over two. And I put a plus sign here because I'm looking for the ground states, so I know that I don't want any node for my wave function. So I'm looking for this type of, uh, of, of psi of r, and now I have to, to say that my, my light particle interacts with the heavy particles, and for this, I simply use beta pi r's boundary condition. So there are many ways for, to formulate beta pi L's uh, boundary condition. The way which is convenient here, you can check that it is equivalent to your favorite way if you are not familiar with this one, is to say that the derivative respect to R of R psi is just equal to the value of R psi itself times minus one over A. And when you do this, uh, you, you implement for psi, you take what I've written here, and you get this condition. It's, uh, I, mean, I don't do it here on the screen, but it's really uh, straightforward. You get that kappa, again, the, the, what, what I've used here to parameterize the energy of my light particle. Kappa should satisfy this equation, kappa minus exponential minus kappa r over r. r, again, is a distance between the two heavy particles, is one over a. And now, if I assume that a tends to infinity, so I'm just uh, about to have a bound state between heavy and light, but not yet. Then I have to solve this equation. So I a tends to infinity, so this is zero. So I have kappa r, which should be equal to exponential minus kappa r. This is an equation which is a transcendental, but you can look for numerical solution. Kappa r has, should be equal to point, nearly point 0.6. So kappa should be point 0.6 over r. And the energy, E of R should be one over R square because kappa is one over R and the energy is, what is kappa square. And this is exactly what I wanted. Now I get an energy which is varying like one over R square. So as usual in born oppenheimer approximation, this energy of the ground state of the light particle is going to play the role of a potential energy for the motion of the two heavy particles. The two heavy particles interact with a one over R square potential, a scale invariant potential. And this is exactly what I wanted. So the second part within born upon approximation is to look for the motion of the heavy particle with this one over R square potential. So I have the kinetic energy for the heavy particle with the capital M here. Now here I have what I found for, from the, for the energy of the light particle, which plays the role of this potential energy, G over R square psi equal E psi. But I have found at the previous slide this value of little g. And I look for energy E equal E negative because I want a bound state for the two heavy particles. And now, again, scale invariance tell me a very strong result. If I know this is the same result as the one I had for the soliton, if I know an energy for psi of R with energy E here, then if I rescale my wave function by, by changing R to R over lambda, I will get another solution of my equation with an energy E over lambda squared. And when you see that, you face immediately a problem because you see that if I found, if I found one bound state, if this is what is written here is correct, I can, I can get other bound states with an arbitrary value of the energy, which goes from minus infinity to zero. If I, as soon as I have one energy, which is negative. 
So of course, this it's not correct. We cannot have energy which tends to minus infinity. It would be nice. It would solve the, the energy problem on, on this planet, but uh, I'm sure there would be other inconvenient. Uh, so one needs to impose a lower bound E0, for example, by imposing a hard core to this wave function psi at some physical value R0, saying that the two heavy particles cannot approach closer to R0. So this imposing a lower bound breaks the continuous scale invariance, but still one keeps a discrete scale invariant that is, if I impose this uh, hard core in R0, I can still find a family of wave function which are a solution of this, of this equation here, but now with the discrete values for lambda uh, and the energies will be again discrete, discrete also, uh, the En will be E0 lambda to the power 2n. So this is, I replace this continuous parameter lambda by this discrete uh, value lambda uh, here, which depends on capital M over N. And here I've given an example of a, a typical energy spectrum that I am expecting for these two heavy particles bound by a light particle. So I'm not going to discuss more the theme of problem. Let me simply say that there have been many beautiful experiments performed with coal gases uh, on a theme of problem, starting with the pioneering work in Innsbruck uh, with three cesium atoms in 2006. And for these heavy, light, heavy systems, there have been a very nice experiment in Chicago and Heidelberg with cesium, lithium, cesium. And the value of the parameter lambda here is uh, approximately six, whereas it was 20.7 for, for, for the particular R of equal mass. That's nice to have a parameter lambda, which is not so far from one because it allows one to see several of these bound states in an experiment. Okay, so this is the end of what I wanted to say in this first part, the time independent problem. And maybe I can stop here for a while and take uh, a few questions. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, John, uh, for the very nice talk already. So indeed, we have several questions. So uh, let me start a bit from, from the very uh, beginning. So you discussed the, the significance of, the, of, of rescaling the land scale by dimensionless parameter and the same, uh, and the same for the time the same parameter for time squared uh, yes. and, and you relate this to the to the fact that in the action things cancel but is there a deeper intuition behind that uh, rescaling uh, deeper uh, i'm sure theorists will say that uh, well i i will show a deeper thing when i look at later at this conformal invariance in the sense you will find a, a group a symmetry group which is uh, which is very rich which is so to one symmetry group but uh, regarding uh, regarding simply time independent problem, I'm not sure I, I can say myself that I see something deeper. Uh, maybe a theorist will see some uh, global symmetry behind that. For me, not changing the equation of motion is already a big, <laughs> relatively deep thing. So I haven't, I don't see anything deeper to say now. <laughs> maybe uh, the, the deep the deeper thing will come with this SO2 one dynamical symmetry. Mm -hmm. And in that, con well, and in, in the introduction also, uh, Max Levenstein is actually asking, what about the scale invariance in quantum field theory? <laughs> yes, so it's it's a relativistic domain now. Uh, and uh, I'm sure Bashek actually knows much more than I do. So I would be very careful not to say any, anything wrong. I mean, if you take electromagnetism, there is a scale invariance behind that. There are many instances, as soon as you turn to relativity, where scale invariance plays an important role. But again, this is not my field, so I would be very cautious. I can refer people who are interested, probably not Mashek because Mashek knows a lot, but people who are interested in two relativistic aspects, uh, there are very nice lecture notes by Willis Verger uh, uh, that he made. He, he made a series of lectures uh, recently at the Collège de France, and uh, he wrote lecture notes which are online, and he has a few pages on uh, scale invariance in relativistic problems, and I will refer you to, to the, the notes of, of Vili because the notes of Vili are, are really very nice. And everything I would say would be paraphrasing, not as well, what Vili what has wrote. So, uh, has written, excuse me. So, uh, but uh, Mashek is correct. The, there is a lot more that, to scale invariance than what I just said. Maybe, as I said at the beginning, scale invariance emerge from uh, relativistic problem, uh, high energy problems. And um, we have also a question by Bill Phillips. So he oh. says, I, I understand the criticality of 2D in, in the competition of kinetic energy and interacting energy leading to scale invariance, but it still seems that vortices have a core. 
Why is this not a natural land scale? Uh, so uh, that's a good point. Uh, what uh, what should I say? Uh, so the the the, the, vort the vortices have a core, yes, uh, which is given simply by the G tilde, which is dimensionless. And so in, in, uh, I'm speaking of 2D. The, the size of the vortex core is one over square root of G tilde, dimensionless, so no, no, no scale, and the square root of the density, uh, which means that actually the only length scale which in turn is the vortex core is the interparticle distance plus G tilde, which is dimensionless. So the, the length scale is, is here, but this is the uh, distance between particles. And this is exactly what the same as what I do when I say I use n lambda square. Actually, there are two length scales in the problem, which is the thermal wavelength uh, lambda and the interparticle distance, which is uh, one of the square root of n. And n lambda square is a dimensionless parameter. So I would say the, the same thing appears when I look at the vortex core. Uh, vortex core depends only on one length scale, which is, uh, which is n. And therefore, if I take the healing length psi and measure it in terms of uh, lambda, I will get something uh, dimensionless. So uh, there is no specific length scale associated with vortex core. It is, again, the interparticle distance. This is the only one I have at my disposal, uh, plus, plus thermal wavelengths. We have I been satisfied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, we have... need a board maybe to, to, have, to make clear, yes, but uh, yes, yes. there is no, yes, there is no, yes, the, the, the healing length in 2D is one of our square root of G tilde times density, 2D density. We actually have more questions from uh, Bill Phillips. So next one is uh, concerning solitons in 2D. What about dark solitons? Aha, uh -huh. uh, that's a good question. Uh, so uh, in order to make a dark, yes. Uh, it's a long story. Uh, well, yes, I, I, I will need a board to do it. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't have uh, I mean, uh, good question, Bill, but again, uh, that's, I'm afraid that it could take me too long to, to answer that. Uh, you, you have to, to um, what can I say? Uh, I mean, a dark solitone is close to a vortex. So, I mean, it comes back, uh, dark soliton in 2D. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a core and uh, if I, it's, 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 it's close to a vortex. So if I, if I put a phase winding, it will be stable. And then we are back to the initial question. Uh, do I get, uh, do, do I get a specific length scale for the, for the, for my vortex? And the answer is not really, it's just uh, gain the density. If I don't have the phase winding, then it's not going to be stable at all. Uh, so it will not be protected. So maybe this is a simple answer. Uh, a dark soliton in 2D for me, if it is protected by some phase winding, is a vortex. And uh, this, is, this is the best I can answer in, in short. And if there is no protection by the phase winding, I, I think the solution will not be at all stable. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question regarding the town soliton. Um, um, the town solitons corresponds to a fine-tuned condition where kinetic and interaction energies scale in the same way and exactly compensate each other. How do terms that go yes. beyond the classical field description affect it? That is, what happens when quantum fluctuations are included? Do they stabilize or destabilize the solid? <laughs> good, good question also. Uh, actually, I have a slide on that. Uh, maybe I can go to this slide. That's maybe the simplest thing to do. Let me see. Uh, this is the slide I wanted to show. Uh, oops, I'm not sure what my computer is doing now. Yes, okay. Uh, so actually, oops, this is a this analysis which was uh, performed by Hammer and Son, going beyond uh, the, the classical field analysis. So uh, as soon as you turn to quantum mechanics, in order to regularize the, the contact interaction, uh, you need to put some length scale. That is, you need to put a UV cutoff. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the typical size, physical size to, for the UV cutoff is the van der Waals length, but it, can, it could be any length depending on the physical problem you are looking at. But in any case, you have to put some cutoff, otherwise you have divergences. And the fact that you put a UV cutoff uh, means actually that there is a size now for any value of N. Uh, so the short answer to the question was uh, putting, uh, put, regularizing the contact interaction stabilizes the soliton. But there is more to that, uh, which is that 
uh, what, what Hammer and Son got was also a geometrical scaling of the size of the soliton with n particle uh, and the size of the soliton with n plus one particle. And this ratio is uh, typically three. I mean, it's a number, more precise number, but it's typically three. Which means, for example, that if the solitons that I've shown you before works well for 1,000 atoms, uh, then if I try to make a soliton that should be stable according to Hammer and Son, and there is no reason to doubt from what they say, but the size of a soliton with uh, 20 particles more, so 1,020, will be 10 to the 9 smaller, just 3 to the power 20, 10 to minus 9. And if you take a soliton with 10 particles less, 20 particles less, so 980 particles, you will have a size which will be 10 to the 9 larger. And of course, 10 to the minus 9 smaller, 10 to the minus 9 larger, 10 to the plus 9 larger makes no sense. I mean, this is beyond the sign of a, of a nuclei, and this is much larger than the size of the vacuum chamber. So in practice, for any interaction strength very small compared to one, which corresponds to this value three here, the, the predicted value of sigma n is, is valid only, well, physically irreducible only if we are at the tens value. Now, if we go to a, a strongly interacting case, then uh, uh, you could hope to see a soliton with five particles, and then a soliton with six particles, which will be three times smaller, and a soliton with four particles, which will be three times larger. So then for G very large compared to, to not very large, G larger than one, say, uh, so interaction strength larger than one, one could form soliton with very small number of particles because the product G times N should be on the order of six, but if G is one, six particles are enough. And then you will see the scaling, but for our very small value of G, uh, where we had typically 1000 particles in the soliton, it was hopeless to see what Adam Hanson had predicted. I hope this was clear. Yeah, thank you. Maybe, I mean, we have actually several questions, but not to interrupt the talk too much. Uh, let's maybe have one more uh, from Bill Phillips. Okay. He asks, for the town soliton, how does a droplet decide how big it is going to be? How big it's going to be? Yeah. Uh, you mean, so this, in our case, uh, we didn't let the droplet decide. Uh, in our case, we were really printing the soliton wave function and we were printing it either big or small with the proper atom number. Uh, in the experiment in Purdue, it was uh, really a, a, an instability. Uh, they, were, they were changing suddenly G tilde from a positive to a negative value. So they had some uh, dynamical instability, well, some instability, not dynamic, some instability in the system. And uh, when it was too big, it was collapsing until the number of particles which was lost was bringing the, the particle number to a proper value. And that's how I think the droplets were forming. So uh, the, the, the gas started to, con to contract. And thanks to, to, to particle losses due to three body recombination and some effects like that, I think then they would get something with a proper atom number and then the, the collapse would stop. That's how I understand this, I understand. But I didn't run myself simulation to check that this is, this is indeed the mechanism. I think this is an interesting uh, pro problem to study from uh, in detail from the, from the theoretical point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Then if that's okay with you, I would suggest that we continue uh, with the talk. Okay. And we can... Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So let me see where I was. Here. Okay, so all I've discussed up to now was this scale invariance for time independent problems. So I would like now to turn to uh, what happens if I introduce uh, time uh, as really a uh, dyn an interesting variable in the problem. And uh, this was done uh, by, by uh, some people first by, by Niederer in, in for simply the, the, the Schrodinger equation and Pitayevsky and Roche for the for the gross pitayevsky case. And uh, the, the key point here is that if I look for the transformation that maintain either the Schrodinger equation invariant or the gross pitayevsky equation invariant. So I first found the Galilean transformation, translations, rotations, but there are actually also other transformations that leave the, the, the GP equation invariant for, for the 2D Bose gas or the unitary 2D Fermi gas invariant, which are the one I have already mentioned, the dilatation, so divided r by lambda, divided time by lambda square. Uh, one that everyone knows is from isolated system, time independent Hamiltonian time translation. If I change time by t plus, to t plus t0 without changing position, then 
I get the same dynamics. And the third kind of transformation are the so-called expansion, where now I rescale position by a coefficient, which depends on time linearly, gamma t plus one, and I make a conformal transformation on time, a specific conformal transformation, t divided by gamma t plus one. And I can combine these three, uh, these three transformations. So I have three parameters, lambda, t0, gamma. I can combine them, and I have a three-parameter group. And this group describes a dynamical symmetry uh, of, of my system. Uh, by dynamical symmetry, I mean it's a symmetry which is not a geometrical symmetry like the translational invariance or rotation. It's another symmetry, uh, which some kind called hidden because it's not, do not see obvious. It's not obvious to see. Uh, and this symmetry is associated with the two dimensional Lorentz group SO21. I will tell you why Lorentz group here, uh, why relativity appears in this, uh, in this problem uh, in a moment. But just before that, I should say, uh, this was discovered by Niederer a long time ago, that actually here what I've discussed are transformation for either a single particle or for the, the GP equation in the absence of any potential. But you can extend uh, what I'm going to say to the to a harmonic trap, that is a one half m omega square r square potential with a slight modification of this transformation, but nothing very uh, complicated. OK, so uh, what is this SO21 symmetry? So in order to see this symmetry, uh, let me introduce three operators. Uh, the first one is the Hamiltonian, uh, well, the Hamiltonian associated with kinetic energy, uh, pj squared of 2m. Uh, well, let's see, uh, I introduce the interaction energy, one half of V of R R minus R J. So this can be, for example, one over R square, but uh, it can be uh, also this contact interaction in, uh, in 2D, or it can be, it will not be written this way, but it can be the interaction described by beta pyros condition for the Fermi gas. And then I have the potential energy if I work in a harmonic potential. Let me, let me assume that I have a harmonic potential here. So one half of M omega square, R J square. And so I define three other operators now, L1, L2, L3, uh, which are the following. L3 is simply the total Hamiltonian, so the sum of the three operators I've written here, sum of kinetic interaction and potential energy here, divided by 2h bar omega to get something dimensionless. Uh, L1 is nearly the same thing, except now I put a minus sign in front of the potential energy, so I take kinetic plus interaction minus potential, and the middle operator, L2, is what is sometimes called the virial. It's a, the product of position time momentum, properly symmetrized because position momentum do not commute in quantum mechanics with a factor one fourth in front. And now, what is quite remarkable is that if you look at the commutation relation between these three operators, they form a closed algebra. The commutation between L1 and L2 is minus IH bar L3. Commutation between L2 and L3 is IH bar L1. Commutation between L3 and L1 is IH bar L2. And for all people online, this is probably very reminiscent of what we all learn about angular momentum in quantum mechanics, except for one little thing, which is this minus sign here. So you could say, oh, this minus sign is, is boring, but let's change the sign of L3, for example. But of course, if you, if you define L3 prime equal minus L3 to get rid of this minus sign here, you will recover the minus sign here and here. So you cannot eliminate the minus sign. And so you get an algebra which is very similar to the, to the algebra of O3, that is the algebra of angular momentum in three dimensions, describing rotation in our usual space, except for this minus sign here. And this minus sign actually tells you that uh, the, the invariant is not uh, what we are used to, which is the square of the angular momentum, L1 square plus L2 square plus L3 square. But because of the minus sign, which is here, the invariant is L1 square plus L2 square minus L3 square. And this is why it is called actually uh, the, the, the two dimensional Lorentz group, because this is very reminiscent, and actually it's more than reminiscent, there is something deep behind. This is reminiscent of the metric of uh, the Lorentz group, where you get dx square plus dy square minus dt square uh, when you do relativity. So, dx square plus dy square minus dt square. So this is what will emerge if you do, uh, if you look at some symmetric group in relative, for relativity in two dimensions of space and one dimension of time. 
I will not turn to relativity in, in what follows, but I wanted to emphasize this algebra, which again is very close to what we are all used to, but not completely the same. Okay, so this dynamical symmetry is very nice because uh, when you have a symmetry like this, uh, it allows you to connect various solutions of, uh, the, of, of your equation of motion, that is, of the Schrodinger equation, if you, took, uh, if you, if you, if you take uh, the 2D Bose gas, for example, the Bose specific equation. So I already did that on a time independent problem for a theme of problem by saying, for example, if I have a, a solution with energy E, I have a solution of energy E over lambda square by changing, by, by changing my wave function. But now I'm, I can do it uh, with a time dependent solution. If I have some solution, for example, for my gas evolving in a harmonic potential of frequency omega zero, and if it is, I have scale invariance or conformal invariance now, I can also find solutions in a trap whose frequency omega depends on time. So conformal invariance allows one to link the solution of the n-body Schrodinger equation in a trap of frequency omega zero to the solution in a trap with another frequency omega with omega which may possibly depend on time or I can take also omega equals zero and then I have a, a gas which is uh, moving freely in space. So for scale invariant system or conformal invariant system, I can relate what happens in a trap and what, can, what happens in free space. And the parameter lambda here uh, is a solution of the well-known equation in mathematical physics. It's the so-called Ermakov equation, the second derivative of lambda plus omega square of t lambda. So this, this is omega of t, which is here, as is equal to omega zero square, where omega zero is a frequency in the initial trap divided by lambda cube. So it's a nonlinear equation, but once you have solved this equation, you know exactly what happens to, to the system on the right, knowing what happens on the system on the left. And this was developed by many authors. I have listed some here, but I've probably forgotten some also some other important contributions. So one very uh, nice uh, uh, illustration of this uh, dynamical symmetry is the breathing mode. And this was understood by Peter Yevke and Roche uh, in 97, so now, now a long time ago. Uh, this, uh, this breathing mode works in the following way. As I said, it's a smoking gun of this SO21 symmetry. Uh, you just assume that you take your gas at t equals zero and you prepare it with an arbitrary shape. At time t equals zero, you let your system evolve in a trap of frequency omega in the presence of interaction. And after some time, you measure R squared. That is, uh, you measure the average value of the potential energy of the gas in the trap, since the potential energy is simply one half of m omega square r square. And what you can immediately predict, thanks to this SO21 symmetry, is that you will have a perfectly periodic evolution of r square at frequency 2 omega. And it's easy to show this result with what I have already uh, given you. So I will do it here, it's just a few equations. So I remind you the definition of the three operators, L1, L2, L3 that I've written. L3 was simply the Hamiltonian, we scaled by 2 h bar omega, and L1 was nearly the Hamiltonian, except for this minus sign here in front of the potential energy. And L2 was this uh, Rp plus Pr. So now let's adopt the Heisenberg uh, picture in order to look at what happened at the system. So in the Heisenberg picture, I remind you that the wave function are fixed, but the operators evolve. And the evolution of an operator is given by AH bar times its commutator with the Hamiltonian. So DL1 over DT, the sum of kinetic plus interaction minus potential, is proportional to the commutator between H and L1, but H is simply L3. So I have to take the commutator L3 and L1, which is L2. Is a minus two omega here if you do the algebra properly. And dl2 over dt is the commutator of h with l2, so commutator of l3 with l2, and this is l1. So I have a dl1 over dt, which is l2, dl2 over dt, which is l1. So I have to get a closed equation for l1, which is simply the equation of a harmonic oscillator. And so l1 as an operator will evolve, and so will uh, its average value. And uh, of course, the sum of kinetic plus interaction plus potential, that is total energy, is fixed. 
So what I deduce from the evolution of L1 is that I will have an out of phase evolution of kinetic plus interaction on the one hand and potential energy on the other hand. The sum of the three will stay constant, but I will have an oscillation of the two. And this is exactly what Pitayevsky and Roche predicted. Perfect periodic evolution of the second moment R square, which is the average of the potential energy. E point. So you can do an experiment. So this is an experiment we did in Paris. Uh, you start with, as I said, an arbitrary shape. So here we took something which was a, a square 2D both gas. Uh, so uniform feeling of a square. We release this uh, square 2D both gas in an harmonic potential at time t equals zero. We let the gas evolve in this harmonic potential. So the particle evolve, interact, and we measure our square as a function of time. And there is a perfect evolution of our square. So after five periods here, the square has become something which is more or less a disk, but the average value of R square measured simply from this picture here is exactly equal to the, well, exactly within error bars, uh, to, to this, uh, to the value of R square at time t equals zero. So uh, this brings two questions. The first one is related to the one that was asked already for the solitons. Uh, this holds at the classical field level, but uh, what happens if, uh, if I turn to a quantum version of the 2D physics, uh, which is not scale invariant because I, I have to regularize the contact interaction. So what about quantum corrections? And a uh, last, last question that I would like to address if I have some time is to go beyond uh, the evolution of simply R square to look at the evolution of other moments, R4, R6, and to ask whether the other moments, R4, R6, can also be periodic. So the SO2 and algebra doesn't tell me anything about the other moment, but still it's a question which is relevant. So I would like now to address these two questions. So the first one, what about quantum correction? This is what is called the quantum anomaly. I have already introduced uh, this term. The quantum anomaly, very generally speaking, is a feature that happens in physics where you have some symmetry which is present at the classical field level, but this symmetry is broken when you turn to quantum uh, physics because for doing quantum physics, you need to introduce some regularization operation and this regularization operation breaks the symmetry you started from. So for this SO2-1 group, uh, for the 2D Bose gas, this was studied by uh, Olshani, uh, Perrin, Laurent, and also by Hoffman. So I, again, this 2D, the scale conformal variance holds only at the classical field level. I need to regularize the contact interaction, which is going to break the symmetry. And this was investigating in a 2D Fermi gas. This uh, actually so it's a, a Bose gas because you, you use a Fermi gas to form uh, Bose molecules, Bose dimers. Uh, so what I'm reporting here is an experiment that was done in uh, Selim Joachim's group in Heidelberg. Uh, so the gas uh, is confined in a isotropic harmonic trap here, a 2D isotropic harmonic trap. And at a given time, you excite the, the gas, so you excite the breathing mode of the, of the gas. Uh, you also excite the, 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 the motion of the dipole. So the motion of the dipole, you can see it in red here. So this motion of the dipole is always at frequency omega. And the motion of, the, of the, the, the breathing mode is, if you trust classical field theory, occurring at two omega. Uh, but if you uh, look for some quantum correction, quantum anomaly, you may want to look at deviation of this oscillation, the blue oscillation here, with respect to two omega. And this is what was done in the group of Selim Kim. So this is the ratio of omega b, the breathing mode divided by the motion of the, the dipole. Uh, so it's close to two, uh, the measurement. So you see here 1.98 and the top is 2.25. So it's all close to two, but there is some deviation with respect to two where the interactions are, are large. Those interactions here are described by a 2D scattering lengths. Uh, so where the interactions are, are large, close to the, actually the, the, the resonance, uh, fetch bar resonance for, for, the, for this gas. There is a deviation with respect to two. The deviation is quite far from, uh, from what was expected theoretically. Uh, what was expected theoretically, you can see it in the inset. This, it should have gone nearly up to 2.2, whereas what was seen in the experiment was only a small fraction of that. 
I'm not sure that the discrepancy is completely understood here, so uh, I, I don't want to comment on it. But the similar results have been obtained in Prince Velgum, in Prince Bern, also with a similar deviation at the level of a few percent. So notably smaller than uh, what expected, was expected theoretically, but still, uh, still not noticeable. That is, the, the fact that it's not strictly two omega as it would be predicted from a classical theory is certainly validated. Okay. Uh, Dear organizers, do I have time for the last part? I would need five to 10 minutes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Okay, good. So let me turn to, to the last uh, question I, I was raising, which was about breathers. That is, are there shapes which lead to a fully periodic motion at frequency two omega? Uh, so, so now I forget about quantum anomaly and back to the classic pole field description. And I asked, are there shapes that classic the classical field level will be fully periodic. That is, all moments, all the moments R to the N will be periodic, not only R, R square, like what I've shown before, all moments are periodic. Uh, so we were looking at this question in Paris, and uh, I mean, we were trying a few things, uh, numerically, experimentally, and in the end, we found one example of situations where uh, we go indeed beyond the result of Pitayevsky and Roche, this uh, uh, second periodicity of the second moment, that is we have found one shape that is completely periodic in uh, harmonic potential. And this shape is the equilateral triangle, provided uh, we work in the hydrodynamic regime that is uh, NG uh, large compared to one. So we start with an equilateral triangle, which is nearly uniformly filled. This is what uh, we, is, is brought by, by this NG large compared to one. So it's uniformly field. We release this equilateral triangle in a isotropic harmonic potential of frequency omega. And we find that after half of a period, we have recovered exactly the equilateral triangle we started with. Again, exactly within the experimental errors. But if you solve the GP equation on, uh, on a grid, uh, here 1000 by 1000 grid, you find that you get an excellent overlap between the wave function at time t over two and the initial wave function. The overlap here is uh, better than, uh, well, approaches the, the 10 to minus three. And we've tried several other polygonal shapes and we have found no shape that has the same periodicity. You have seen before a square gives something which is not at all a square after T over two and uh, after more period also. So this was uh, really surprising for us. We, we were wondering whether this was a manifestation, manifestation of scaling invariance. So uh, we did a simple test on a computer. We took uh, classical particles interacting by a one over square potential, repulsive one over square potential, which is the first example I gave uh, of, a, of a scale invariant uh, problem. So we start with particles in a triangle like this. Uh, I've colored some in red, some in blue, so that you can follow the trajectory, some, some in green also. And after T over A, this is what I get. After T over four, I recover nearly the, the triangle upside down. And if I go to T over two, I will recover the, the triangle pointing upwards. And the more and more particle I put, so this is a simulation. The simulation was done with only 4,000 particles, but I, we could do the simulation with uh, up to 100,000 particles. And what we get after a quarter of, uh, of period, so uh, looks more and more like uh, a flip triangle when we, when we try to do some finite size scaling. Uh, probably we need some people much more clever than us to, to study really the, the limit when uh, the number of particles tend to infinity, but uh, it, seems, it seems to be an indication that also the one over our square potential gives a specific periodic behavior for a triangle. So for us, it was really a mystery. I mean, we, we, we played with computers to, to explore various things, but it was really a mystery until last year where there were two very nice papers, theoretical papers, which appeared by uh, Shi, Gao, and Tsai, uh, and also by Maxim Olshani and co-workers. Uh, Shi, Gao, and Tsai really proved uh, the, the result that we obtained for triangle is uh, indeed, uh, well, hold in the, holds indeed, this result holds. Uh, they have a proof which is really subtle, so I'm not going to, to enter into it, but what they have found is that there are some situations where the interacting hydrodynamic equations, which are the equations that describe uh, our 2D gas 
in the Thomas Fermi regime, in the limit where Ng is large compared to one. So there are situations where the solution of interacting hydrodynamic equation can be exactly constructed from the dynamics of non-interacting ideal gases. And in their proof, scale invariance is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. If it were sufficient, then it would work also for square, for pentagon, hexagon. So it doesn't, uh, again, it doesn't hold for squares or pentagons, but you need scale invariance for the proof. Another ingredient of the proof and the reason for which the equilateral triangle works and not, uh, not a square, for example, is that at some place in the proof, you have to take the intersection between the initial shape and another shape, which is translated uh, from, the, from, from the initial shape, but which keeps the same, uh, the same global structure. Uh, so you have to take, for example, the interaction of the tri triangle here and triangle there. And here, what is important is that the intersection is still an equilateral, equilateral triangle. If you take a square, this is not true. If you take the interaction of a square with another square, you get a rectangle. If you take the interaction of an hexagon with an hexagon, you don't get an hexagon. You may even get a pentagon. So the, in their proof, they need this property here, which is valid only for a triangle, equilateral triangle. But they also prove that in 3D, if some experimentalists are know how to do the experiment, if you take a three tetrahedron and take, for example, a, a unitary Fermi gas, form initially a 3D tetrahedron, put it in a harmonic potential, this tri tetrahedron should shrink and reappear periodically. So that would be a very nice experiment, which would, uh, which would be an experimental verification of this prediction by Shigao and Sai. And the paper by Olshani was also very interesting because uh, it answered a question that we had at the beginning, which is the following. Since we start with a, a triangle which is uniformly filled up to the edge where you have, you have a sharp boundary, we were really afraid that we would get some shock waves in the evolution of these uh, sharp boundaries. And uh, Olshani and co-workers showed that there is no catastrophe at all associated with this, uh, with this uh, sharp boundaries in the hydrodynamic equation that were used by, uh, by Xi et al. So with these two nice papers, I think now the triangle mystery is solved, but now there is a, the ball in, on the side of the experimentalist if they, if they know how to, to achieve this one. Okay, so uh, I will stop here. Let me just summarize what I have uh, discussed. So uh, conformal invariance, I think, is a nice example of a dynamical, so-called hidden symmetry, that is transformation that leads the equation of motion invariant. They are valid either at the quantum field level for the 3D unitary gas or only at the classical field level for the 2D both gas. And in the latter case, uh, they, provide, uh, they provide an example of a quantum anomaly in low energy physics. This is what we have seen for the soliton. This is what we have seen for the breathing mode. And uh, there is a situation uh, that is valid, which is, a, uh, which is scale invariant in any dimension. This is a one over R square interaction potential. We have seen how this one over square potential can emerge between two particles, two heavy particles, uh, which are bound by a light particle which uh, moves around them. Uh, something I would like to, to address to the whole uh, community of uh, quantum gases is uh, whether we can achieve this one over square potential between many particles at the same time. We often say that with our gases, we can simulate many things. Uh, I would like to know whether we can simulate really a one over r ij to the square between a collection of particles. If we could do that, that would be really nice because then we could study scale invariance in any dimension and it would be uh, quite a, a very nice, I think a very nice tool. But I, I personally, I don't know any way to emulate this one over r square interaction potential except for only uh, few body physics thanks to the FEMOF effect. Okay, so this was a question for me to the audience. Uh, and now I can stop and uh, take more questions. Thank you so much, John, for the very beautiful lecture. So we indeed have uh, questions and, and actually even a comment. So let me start with a comment by Bill Phillips. Uh, he just says the SO21 uh, is a beautifully, beautifully deep perspective on the breeding uh, mode behavior. So okay. Not a, not a question, well, just a comment. I don't take the, the, the congratulation for me, but for Pitaevsky, I'm sure if, if, if he hears it, he will be happy. And Pitaevsky and Roche. And we have a question from, from Maciek uh, Levenstein on the second part. So, in the case of uh, SU3 symmetry, 
uh, there are two ways of going to the classical limit. Either uh, both Casimirs grow or only one, as discovered by Fritz Hacke and his friend, who says, my friend, Marek Kush. What about SO21? Ah, I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, is a, this is a very good point. Uh, uh, I, I, Mashek, no, I don't know the answer, but... Uh, I have never read anything about that uh, for SO21, but this does not mean at all that it does not exist. Just that uh, the, the, what exists has not been conveyed to the, to the cold atom community. Uh, that's a good point. And I don't know whether we can see a manifestation of this if anything like this exists. Uh, uh, we have a question. So you explain how the hardcore land scale breaks uh, the continuous scale invariance in the F of problem, turning turning it only into a discrete scale invariance. Yeah. For the 2D Bose gas in the quantum regime, the regularis regularization of the delta potential implies that you need to introduce a cutoff uh, characteristic length scale. This is precisely what gives rise to quantum anomaly. Why it is in this case doing more than turning the symmetry from continuous to discrete? What is different in these two problems? Uh... Well, in a sense, uh, in the soliton problem, uh, I was getting this ratio of sizes, which is very reminiscent of what happens for a theme of state. When I, when in the Hammer and Stone papers that I discussed uh, as an answer to, the, to, to one of the questions, let me show it again. I would say this geometrical scaling for me is very reminiscent of the, the, the various sizes that I find for my theme of states. Uh, so I would say it's, uh, so here I'm looking at the bound state, like for the theme of state, it's a bound state of many particles uh, and the calculation that by Amorenson are not as precise as, as the pre calculation one, when one does for, 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 for three, three body physics. But I would say this geometrical scaling is still very reminiscent. Uh, so uh, I don't see a, I don't see a major difference here. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Good, another question. So for the 3D unitary Fermi gas breathers, does one expect their existence both in the normal and in the superfluid phase, since both hydrodynamics and scale invariants hold also above TC, or are there more constraints to the proof of the breather's existence? Ah. Uh, uh, for, okay, okay, so at least for us, it's all uh, t equals zero result. That is, any uh, any deviation from t equals zero will uh, will cause some um, some um, some damping or uh, of the oscillation or some uh, yes uh, damping yes okay or collapse of the oscillation. Uh, what you need really at the beginning is, is something uniform. You need to start with a uniform density, and that's why temperature will cause to your wave function classically some, some, some ripples, uh, random ripples, and that will uh, spoil the, the, the oscillation. Uh, I would say the same thing occurs, I think, uh, I would have to, to check again, but the same thing occurs for, for the 3D Fermi gas. You need to start with a uniform filling of uh, the tetrahedron, and if you, if you are in the normal regime, that is, if you have some non-zero temperature, temperature which is above the critical temperature, uh, then you will have some density fluctuation at the beginning. And I'm afraid the density fluctuation will spoil uh, the quality of the oscillation. So for me, this is a zero temperature result because of the preparation, not because of the equation of motion, but because of the preparation of the initial state. Good. Um, if uh, that's okay with you, there are also some questions from the first part. So maybe we can also okay, ask sure, uh, some yes. questions uh, from the first part. So actually there was, uh, there is a question from Bill Phillips regarding the first part. And this is uh, about the following. So the limitation on a, on a 2D Bose gas being describable by uh, gross pritaevsky and the regularization of the Delta function. What if you see the real, uh, oh, sorry, what if you use the real short range potential between the atoms? Does the limitation persist? Uh, so, uh, in, in the 2D Bose gas, uh, you, you, dis you describe it by a contact interaction, and the factor G tilde uh, is uh, actually uh, uh, a function of the 3D scattering length. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Maybe maybe I can write an equation uh, just sure. to make things clearer. So, so let me stop sharing this. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I can, maybe, let me see if I can share my iPad, that would be the best. Uh, okay, so if I share that. Do you see something or not? Yes. Yeah. Yes. We see now okay. the slides uh, from the iPad. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, the two D scattering. The, the, the proper way to discuss uh, to discuss physics uh, to do what Bill wants. I think it's uh, ah yes, but now my pen doesn't uh, seem to write. Uh, let's see. So you have a two D scattering length A two now. Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, if I take a gas, to the gas like this, with a thickness LZ, uh, A2 is typically LZ, the thickness of the gas, times some exponential. So I think there is a square root of pi over 2, LZ over A, where A is a 3D scattering length. Okay, so the A2 that you calculate like this involves the exponential of LZ over A. LZ is the thickness of the gas, and in most experiments, this is typically 100 nanometers. Whereas A is a 3D scattering length, and if you don't have a phase power resonance, this is a few nanometers. So here you will have an exponential of a number which is very large compared to one. So A2 is extremely small. A2 is, I mean, uh, uh, not, it's not a physical quantity. I mean, it's 10 to 20 meters or something like this. And so when you look at the scattering amplitude, F, F of theta, uh, so it's, if I write it, it's, there is a four pi. And I think here you have a log of one over plus one of K A2 plus I pi. And when you do, when you go, uh, you expand, you replace the value of A2 here, you will find that you will, you will have this 4 pi divided by 2, and you take the log of this. So you will have a log of uh, K times LZ, and then you will have a log of exponential, which will be this, uh, so there, there are this square root of 2 times pi, so let me, I forget about the numerical coefficient, but you will have this LZ of A, LZ over A, and then you will get the IPI. And here you have a coefficient that I have not written. But the key point, I, the point I want to make is that this LZ over A is large. So again, this is 100 nanometer divided by say five nanometers, so it's 20. And the log here, a log is never equal to 20 because in order to have a log equal to 20, you need the inside of the log to be very, very big. So uh, what Bill is saying is, uh, trying to, 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 to see some effect of this K regularizing, uh, regular, I mean, the, the looking at influence of uh, the, the core size of the atoms, uh, which would make a K dependence of the scattering lengths. But this K dependence is very weak because it's in the log here. And this log is always small compared to LZ over A for our weakly interacting gases. In order to have this log significant here, you need to have LZ over A on the order of one, not more, so that a log on the order of one also can, can be significant, which means that you need to have A on the order of the thickness of the gas. So in order to have, uh, to see what Bill is claiming, that is influence of the size of the atom, uh, you need to have uh, uh, some A, which should be on the order of 100 nanometer. So that is, you need a fano bar resonance in order to have that. Otherwise, we never see any dependence any K dependence that would be the signature in your scattering amplitude of a finite core of the atoms. I hope this is clear. Oh. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's a very, very nice, uh, precise answer. So uh, maybe we have uh, another question on the first part. Um, is the local density approximation and, and scale invariance not somehow at odds to each other? Clearly, there is now a length scale set by the trap. Uh, how slow does the variation have to be for the trap length scales to genuinely not enter? Yes, so yes, it's a good question. You, you need indeed to have uh, to have your gas to be very big 
very large compared to the, to the ground state of the trap. So uh, maybe I can take a, just another test. So the A harmonic oscillator, which is the square root of H bar over M omega, has to be very, very small compared to the size of the gas. Yeah, say uh, Thomas Fermi, if I'm zero temperature, but any, any size of the gas. Uh, I, would like, I would like maybe to be on the safe side, I may also ask to have a harmonic oscillator to be uh, very small compared to Xi, the healing length, uh, cannot hurt. Uh, yes, I mean, this length scale A show should not enter in the problem. Otherwise, I mean, the person asking the question is correct. Is correct. Uh, that would be a length scale in the problem. And I don't want this length scale to enter in the problem. So, uh, uh, one has to be careful with that. Okay. But, well, I'm not sure that this is really needed, actually. But, uh, for, for, for the, uh, yes, maybe, no, maybe, maybe I was too strong by putting this. Uh, let, let me remove that. But certainly, I need this to be true. Mm -hmm. There is a question from the chat. I hope I pronounced them correctly. I think it's Andres Ordo. And he's asking the overlap between triangles yields a triangle for specific approach directions. Squares approaching in diagonal also yield squares, but do yes. not show peri periodicity. Could you comment on this, please? Uh, yes. Uh, so <coughs> the, 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 in the proof, uh, Approaching in one direction is not enough. What three in in the proof is to have uh, the triangle here and another triangle uh, like this one rotating around it. And so you want to look at the intersection of the two figures. So actually it's more like, like this. Intersection of this one and this one. And uh, so what you, you want the interaction, but not only in a, a given direction of approach, but any direction of approach because uh, one has to look at the proof to see how it happens, but uh, you, you, you need to, to go in any direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, maybe um, the last question. Um, in measuring the equation of state for a 2D Bose gas, you show that a single image gives access to the function needed to calculate the density of states. Could you comment on how many atoms we need to have this type of self-averaging with it being dominated by shot noise? If we reduce the atom number, which would break down first, uh, what, uh, sorry, which would uh, break down first, the thermodynamics of the equation of state or the ability for us to extract the density instead of the image being dominated by shot noise? Uh, so if you reduce the atom number, uh, and what is sure is that in, uh, in experiments, we usually average many, many images and we rarely work with single shot images. Right? We, we can do it, but we usually average many images taken with the same temperature, same, uh, same mm. average atom number, and so on. Uh, in principle, I don't see why, why reducing the atom number would be a problem, as long as this condition, which was written here, uh, that the size of the gas is, is very large compared to any length scale in the problem, that is the harmonic oscillator length, the thermal wavelength, the healing length, I don't see why having only a few atoms would be a problem. Then the shot noise will be, of course, a problem. But the shot noise itself, I don't see why it would introduce a length scale. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, yes, I, 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 I would need to 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 to, to discuss with the, with the person to to see what uh, he or she has in mind uh, as a as an issue with the shot noise. Uh, to, Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me finish just uh, also, uh, you know, agreeing with the comment of Christoph Salomon in the chat uh, says great talk. So this was definitely a great talk. So thank you very much. And I'll pass now the <laughs> mic to, to Sebastian. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. thank you also from my side for a really cool talk. And uh, we'll be back on April 7th with yet another colloquium by Hannes Pichler this time. And if you want to get notified about what we do, please go to our website, uh, quantumscienceseminar.com. You should subscribe to our email list, our Google calendar, and you should follow us on Twitter as well. And uh, certainly also check out our sister seminar, the virtual AMO seminar, where tomorrow they'll actually have Mariana Safronova um, giving another talk. That's March 4th. With that, I'd like to thank you for your interest, and we hope to see you again on April 7th and uh, in the, at the same time in the same place. Bye.